Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Game Logic from the Rounding Off Infinity Gaming Channel on YouTube, one of the co-hosts of the Enough to Keep Going Weekly Games podcast on the E2KG Network podcasting channel on YouTube, as well as one of the co-hosts of the Basement Radio Arcade podcast on YouTube. Back with another episode of Talking About Games. This is episode number nine for Saturday, the 16th of March, 2024. So without much further ado, let's get to it. Uh, we've got some pretty neat topics this morning. I'm pretty stoked. Uh, I overslept. A little very rare occasion, but uh, every once in a while, my body uh, gives me no other option and tells me that you need additional rest. <laughs> so that's where we wound up today. If you're not familiar with the format, I'm going to go through some scripted content that I spent the last 24 to 72 hours laying out, deep dive into some topics or oriented around finance, technology, and the history of the games industry associated with current news stories going on around in the news cycle. I'm going to take some breaks grab some coffee, drink a little energy drink, try to keep my throat from getting overly dry, but also keep my energy up, try and get through this podcast. It's about an hour and a half probably of content, and uh, we will see where it goes from there. So first news story that I wanted to go through was Saber is actually rescuing more studios from Embracer than was announced, and that includes Metro Dev 4A. This news story over on VG247 by... Mark Warren. I'll start off with a quote and then get into my research notes. Uh, you know how we recently learned. I, I also don't have over on this podcast station. I also do not have a teleprompter. I have a teleprompter at two of the other stations. Uh, more than that is ridiculously expensive more than it was. So uh, so my cameras will be a little my eyes will be a little off camera today. Uh, for those who have been around for the other episodes where I was using the teleprompter. Uh, you know how we recently learned that Saber Interactive was gaining its independence from the terrifying embrace of Embracer Group? Well, Embracers now officially confirmed that the sale has gone through for a quoted sum of $247 million. But its official announcement looks to have cheekily left out telling you that some of the key studios Saber's taking with it actually seem to be, you know, going with Saber for definite. Uh, so, so I'm not really sure that this is really the confusing issue that some of the gaming news media seem to be trying to make it out to be, uh, by which I mean the notion that the studios owned by Saber would be departing the Embracer group with Saber. You would have kind of expected such an arrangement, other than that the incestuous, kind of turbulent nature of all of the various studios, publishing arms, et cetera, that make up the biomass that is Embracer group, many of which have been renamed over the last four years, is difficult to understand at its root. But it's also something that even the thirsty content creators who keep up with this industry news don't know and really don't care about. Uh, and that brings us to our first major misunderstanding. The Embracer Group is not new. A lot of, again, the gaming news media and content creators talk, of the, talk as if the Embracer Group came out of some unknown primordial ooze back in 2019. But it's actually the old licensing arm of the larger Nordic Games Group, which was so named back in 2011. It was originally labeled the Nordic Games it was originally labeled Nordic Games Licensing. Nordic Games Licensing purchased the THQ IP back in 2013, as well as the THQ trademark. And in 2016, both the licensing arm and the parent company changed their names to THQ Nordic. The parent company then went public later in 2016 and changed its name to the Embracer Group in 2019. And that's why there's kind of this dynamic around this discussion that kind of talks about the Embracer Group as something new, but really it's not. Uh, but all in all, Nordic Games goes all the way back to 2000. Oh, yeah, cables over here on the desk. <laughs> Nordic Games, uh, wait, wait, wait. but all in all, Nordic Games goes all the way back to the 90s when it was founded by a Swedish teenager at the age of 16, sold, bought back for one krona, dissolved in bankruptcy, and then reformed in 2004. That teenager and company founder was Lars Wingerforce, who remains Embracer Group CEO to this day at age 47. So he's been in this game doing this thing for 31 years. Uh, the deal includes 4A games. Now, the pedigree of 4A games goes back to one of my favorite topics in game industry lore, that of the Stalker game franchise. And its originator is the original GSC Game World Studio, which is not the current GSC Game World Studio that is working on Stalker 2. While that studio has members from the original studio, including the studio's owner, who is the brother of the original studio CEO. Keep up, get your pr 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 propeller hats on, because this is this gets spaghetti very quickly. Uh, it is actually a reincorporated studio under the same name as the original GSC Game World, which actually shuttered its doors in 2011. The new studio took the same name and reopened in 2014 under the ownership of Evgeny Hirgovich. But the story of the studio expatriates immediately after the 2011 shutdown saw many of them re 
locate to certain large groupings to specific studios, typically driven along lines of like who knew who and who had worked together before. And 4A was one of the major ones that came out of that schism. Now, for, that's not to say 4A was new. 4A Games had originally opened in 2006, formed by three members who had left GSE Game World earlier over a spat about money shared for Stalker's success, the original Stalker, and how it was distributed between the company owner and its employees. And so when that studio, when GSC Game World shut down in 2011, many of the people who, were who had remained at GSC Game Studio left to then join their former co-workers at 4A, which again had been started in 2006. Now 4A has been through this kind of rope a dope before. They were originally part of the original THQ, which filed for bankruptcy in 2013. This is the original THQ, not the thing that is Embracer Group <laughs> for people who weren't around during that time. Uh, so they were part of the original THQ, which filed for bankruptcy in 2013. And that was the point at which they, the original THQ, sold the licensing and publishing rights to the Metro series to Coke Media for $5.8 million. Uh, Coke Media's video game arm is Deep Silver. Now, if you're not familiar with the Metro IP, the Metro IP is based on a novel, I think a set of novels by, and I didn't record his name down, by Dimitri. I can't remember what his last name is. Uh, but kind of, I, I think maybe pe more pe people are more familiar with like The Witcher, right? And the fact that that comes out of a novelization uh, uh, IP uh, and, and some novels that are, that, you know, tell that whole story. And this is kind of the same deal. Uh, Metro is, you know, a, a, a dystopian kind of uh, tale uh, of a future where uh, when bombs drop, uh, when nuclear bombs drop, you know, lots of uh, Russian citizens uh, go into the Metro substations and like only 50,000 of them survive out of like the 7 billion people population of, uh, of Russia at the time. So uh, to, to, to Coke Media, so going back to this Coke Media, which again, the whole point of that was that they were the recipients of the Metro licensing and publishing rights. And so they kind of occupied the same position, if you will, as uh, CD Projekt Red in terms of where they got the IP and licensing publishing rights for the novel um, uh, from, from the writer of The Witcher. And that's why the, if I'm not mistaken, the Netflix show The Witcher is actually a deal uh, between CD Projekt Red and Netflix and not the author and, and Netflix. Uh, Coke Media has since been renamed to Plyon, which is part of the Embracer Group. Uh, 4A Games was acquired by Saber Interactive just four years ago in 2020 for $36 million in a move that sought to put the licensing and publishing rights holder, which was now Plyon, under the same corporate umbrella as Embracer. So that being the studio who'd worked on the three games in that IP, 4A, even though they would exist in different divisions within the Embracer Group. This new company that will in, this new company now that Saber has made this deal with Embracer to break away from the Embracer umbrella. This is a new company that will include 4A and Saber's other studios and is called Beacon Interactive, which is owned by Saber co-founder Matthew Kark. So change in format today, I'm not going to announce when I'm taking a coffee break. I'm just going to go ahead and take a coffee break. I think people who have been around enough uh, know what's going on when, uh, when I go silent for 30 seconds or so, and uh, new people will catch on. Uh, so this new company, and for, so 4A will join the stable of Saber Studios that already includes 3D Realms, New World Interactive, Slipgate Ironworks, and Madhead Games, as well as several others. When you add in the debt and other liabilities those studios and Saber's own will bring with them, thereby clearing that debt off of Embracer's books, the deal totals to the aforementioned $500 million figure that made the rounds in the news cycle earlier. So there's a bit of a delta with the, I think, press announcement that went out about this deal closing at $264 million. When you tally up all of the additional debt and liabilities, it really gets closer to the $500 million figure that was discussed. Uh, I'm not, I haven't dug into the financial details about whether or not there's some upside from an investor perspective of Embracer reporting it as a $264 million deal. Um, maybe there's better optics on them not talking about the debt that Saber is taking on. There's some other things that I saw, you know, my mutual and friend Falky talking about on Twitter where there's some other kicker whereby if Saber like sells off other assets or something within some number of years, then like Embracer gets some money back. I'm, I'm not sure about the details of that, but you know, that information is out there if you want to go look it up. Uh, 
So clearing debt is, of course, one of the main points of this whole deal, that being the upside for Embracer and bettering their financial health as they prepare for what I am certain is either a selling off of all remaining assets and just becoming an IP clearinghouse or filing for outright bankruptcy. Uh, the games in this portfolio will include Star Trek Infinite, Insurgency, the Mud Runner franchise, as well as developer experience and talent from working on properties in the Warhammer universe. Now, while Saber is getting Metro, I'm sorry, while, so while Saber is getting 4A, who is known for the Metro series of games, the licensing and publishing, as I talked about, for the Metro IP stays with Plyon, which means in the future, if 4A wants to continue to work in that world, Saber will have to come to some teaming agreement with Plyon in order to use the IP. And Plyon is remaining with Embracer, as we've said. And that's why you'll see arrangements like the fact that Metro Awakening, the new VR game announced at PlayStation's most recent state of play, is a game being developed by Vertigo Games, which is a studio in the Coke Media Group, which is, of course, not Plyon. <laughs> also staying with Embracer is Aspire, the studio known for remakes and remasters, Beamdog and various others. Aspire currently under fire for the kind of very bad look of a rollout of the uh, Star Wars uh Battlefront uh, remake uh, with problems with servers, things like 10,000 people buying the game and wanting to get on to play multiplayer, but there only being 162 servers available the first night. Okay, so that wraps up the uh, the Saber Media story. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Japanese, the Japanese games market here in a little bit. And the reason I wanted to cover that was because uh, a few weeks ago on Talking About Games, I talked about some of the difficulties and challenges that uh, game publishers and studios face getting their game deployed in China and why you shouldn't just take it as a hand wave and a very casual, oh, by the way, to talk about um, growth in the games industry and include under that uh, a notion of potential of, uh, of experiencing growth in China because the numbers get misreported, uh, because, um, because it's incredibly difficult to get a game in China because there's all sorts of things that drain off of the revenue when you deploy a game in China, and it's just not easy. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit today about cultural differences and problems that you run into when you try and push that noodle uphill. So we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Uh, you know, we, so I wanted to cover the, the regulatory complications that you face in trying to deploy a game in a specific Chinese country, specific Asian country, that being China, which has a large bulk of the, of the potential gaming customers. Uh, the U.S. is one of the largest markets, and it's neck and neck with China, uh, but but close behind that is is the overall notion of Asia, and in particular, Japan is the is the largest um, holds the largest bulk of that. So we'll get into that here uh, in about a minute. Uh, so thank you much, uh, the real time bomb over in the chat. Uh, thanks for coming through the live stream. I appreciate you. Uh, Saber Studio was Saber Studios working on the Kotor remake. So Saber wasn't uh, Aspire was. Uh, I have actually, I believe Aspire is staying with Embracer. Uh, I've actually had a little bit of a problem trying to track that down. I've seen listings of Aspire as being part of Saber, and then listings of Aspire being part of Embracer. I believe they are staying uh, with Embracer. In fact, I'm going to go back to my script and see if I spelled that out. I wasn't sure. Yeah, no, also saying with the Bracer is Aspire, the studio known for remakes and remasters. So uh, they will be remaining there. Uh, the, so so let me back that up. So, yeah, I found out that Aspire was staying with the Bracer. What I have not been able to track down is KOTOR. That is the problem that I've seen. I thought Aspire was working on KOTOR, but I have seen references to KOTOR being done within Saber, but then Aspire is staying with Embracer. So... That I've lost a little bit of the thread on. Um, as far as I know, I believe that uh, that that title, um, which is in development hell and you know was, was being rebooted and, and shut down, etc. I I think currently, um, while Saber, while Aspire, sorry, has been asked to stop work, it has not necessarily been handed to anyone else. And my understanding was that there was still kind of some some picking and scratching uh, at uh, at the reboot of that uh, of that remake effort. I think that's the best I've been able to do. I will definitely work on trying to track that down throughout the week, though, for the next episode. You've been the first person to give me uh, homework and a research topic, so I appreciate that. I will definitely uh, incorporate that and, uh, and cover it either on the next show or, or on Twitter or both.
Okay, let's go ahead and get into the next story. Uh, this story, uh, Japanese Charts Unicorn Overlord Dom... I'm sorry. Japanese Charts Unicorn Overlord dominates in its debut week. The story by Jim Norman over on Nintendo Life. Uh, I'll start off... Actually, I'll probably wind up just reading a bunch of this before I get into the research topics, but... We're back with another look at the latest Japanese charts from Famitsu, and once again, the ranking is overpowered by a new RPG. Yes, after enjoying a week in the spotlight last time, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has made way for Vanillaware's Unicorn Overlord, which tops this week's charts on Switch, lands in third on PS5, and in eighth on PS4. In fact, the latest tactical RPG has been performing so well that Atlas has started advising customers in Japan to consider buying the game digitally rather than physically as box copies continue to sell out. Talk about popular. Uh, the Japanese exclusive fitness boxing featuring Hatsune Miku is shown the exercise is another new entry this week, taking fourth place with 14,128 sales and pushing Nintendo's latest Mario versus Donkey Kong down to fifth. Uh, and then we'll get a little bit into, uh, into the list itself. Uh, so the things I wanted to, I had nab it, sorry. So things I wanted to cover on this topic. Uh, so again, let's just talk about the top 10 list itself. You've got Unicorn Overlord in at number one, which is a March release uh, and new on the charts. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which came out at the end of February. Uh, That title being on PlayStation 5. Uh, Also on PlayStation 5, uh, Unicorn Overlord. And when these things are listed, as far as I understand it, is that that version of the SKU on that particular platform. I I haven't, I I didn't realize that, and I didn't take a look at each one of these things to look at whether or not they're multi-plat or not. Uh, Nintendo Switch Fitness Boxing featuring Hitsuru Miku is showing exercise, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in at number four. Mario vs. Donkey Kong, which is a mid-February release in at number five. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which came all, yeah, all the way back in 2017, is <laughs> in at number six. Super Mario Brothers Wonder, uh, which came out October of last year at number seven. Number eight is Unicorn Over is the PS4 version of Unicorn Overlord. Yeah, so this is a chart that when they're that they split the titles out. So if you ever look at NPD numbers or most other sales numbers, typically the way they list it is they'll list the game and then you'll see the platforms that that game is on behind the sales listing and the kind of unspoken nuance is that those platforms are typically listed in the order of the sales numbers. So for instance, if you see a listing on MPD on an MPD chart, which is now called Circana, but I still call it MPD. If you see a listing for a game on an MPD chart like MLB The Show, and the order that it lists the platforms that that game is on is like PS5, PS4, Xbox, and Nintendo Switch, that means the largest sales numbers are on PS5, PS4 second, Xbox third, uh, Nintendo Switch fourth. Uh, so going back to this chart, uh, Unicorn Overlord, the PS4 version of Unicorn Overlord, uh, which as I said, which is, is an early March release and is new on the charts, is in at number eight. Number nine is Momotaru, Dentetsu World, Chikiyu Wakibu de Mawaturu. Uh, I don't know why that... <laughs> of all the titles on the list... That one is the uh, is the most Japanese and the most difficult for me to pronounce. I'm sure I got it wrong. Uh, the Nintendo Switch version of that is in at number nine. That was a November release. And Splatoon 3 from November of 2022 is in at number 10. Um, so uh, give me just one sec. So let's talk about some of the economics. I said I wasn't going to announce when I took a coffee break, and and there I went. Uh, So Japan is the third in the world in GDP. They are 19th on the Human Development Index, which is an index that charts the relative quality of life and societal evolution across various countries. They have a life expectancy of 85.3 years and one of the lowest infant mortality rates in the world. It also has the third largest gaming market after the U.S. and China, turning some $19.9 billion of revenue in 2022. People often talk about the Japanese market as if it is irrelevant, as if the demand signal coming from Japan for types and styles of games, as well as the features desired or undesired in consoles, doesn't have an impact. The fact is that the Japanese tastes are very important, as these numbers show. And in fact, Asia as a geographic region will be the one that Xbox needs to win if its strategy of exclusives doesn't matter, more games on every screen is going to be successful. 
In 2021, Nintendo sold more Nintendo Switches in Japan than units combined of PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, and Xbox, proving the handset gaming console's popularity with Japanese gamers. The real-time bomb uh, in the chat says, seems Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is actually selling good, despite some people saying it's not. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm not the foremost expert on Final Fantasy sales numbers. Uh, I, I think my co-host on, um, on the Basement Radio Arcade podcast, and I think Brap mentioned this on a rant that he did. You know, we've seen a decline of that series of sales in Japan uh, since Final Fantasy 13. Uh, and so that game, you know, not not selling well in Japan, that's not new. Um, it's actually been going on for some time. But yeah, I have seen also the reports that Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is, is selling well. What people always do, what, it seems like what people do is they compare the sales numbers to how the title sold during the pandemic. Well, the problem is, the first part of Final Fantasy VII uh, came out literally within 30 days of the entire planet going on lockdown. <laughs> so you would think that a very popular video game franchise that came out right at that at that opportune time. Same thing for Animal Crossing Horizons, which I think launched. I think launched that that same that same month in the month of March. So like right as we went on lockdown, and then Final Fantasy VII uh, remake I think came a little bit after. But those this uh, we. <sighs> We're having a tendency in the gaming conversation to look at numbers during the pandemic, which we should all know and recognize was an incredible time uh, of of ballooning growth in the industry. And then there's a deflation that's going on, very much similar to the dot-com bubble burst uh, of 1999-2000. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's quite that extreme, but the effect in the dynamic is similar. And so it's really inaccurate and really skews the statistical view and the financial view to look at sales, revenue, performance, profitability during the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic years, and I would really say 2000 to 2020, 2020 to 2022, and then compare those numbers thereafter and say, and then say, oh, look, the industry sliding backwards, or you know, a given franchise isn't selling as well, or a given console isn't selling as well. Um, uh, so, also about a third of the about a third of the gamers in Japan play on PC a number that continues to grow in the region. 58% of the population of Japan are gamers, with 70% of mobile phone owners also playing games, 95% of whom play games at least once per week. Combined, the number of Japanese gamers playing on console and PC is 52% of their population. Uh, I'm sorry, of their, of their gamer population. Uh, the most popular console game genres are RPGs at 46%, adventure games at 35% and simulation games at 32%. So I want to pause here, right? Because those genres and the way they sell in the Japanese region are different than Western, <laughs> than, than Western modalities, right? RPGs probably is super high in the West, but adventure games, point and click adventure games on PC and console, I don't believe that they sell as high as 35% and in are, in are the number two popular uh, genre. Simulation games, right? You're talking... Uh, games like you know a Gran Turismo, a Forza, uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator, things, things, genre, a genre that typically takes an investment in additional equipment to really eke the most benefit out of it. Um, not as high a selling uh, genre here. And in fact, I mentioned, I think either on E2KG or maybe on on an episode of talking about games, how uh, it was on E2KG, how there was a period like if you've if you've been in gaming since before you know 1999. And you saw in the early 2000s and you saw flight simulators and how there was just, a, a, I wouldn't say a glut, but flight, flight simulators and racing simulators were hugely popular. You had the Grand Prix uh, game that was on PC. You had Microsoft Flight Simulator, which back then used to come out like every a new iteration every two years. Um, you had Combat Flight Simulator, which was done by Microsoft, you know, one and two. You had things like MIG Alley Falcon 4.0, uh, MIG 29, MIG 19, you know, all f15 f60 all of these like flight like a new like there were a half dozen flight sims at least that came out every single year if not more and then it just came to a screeching halt and the end result and the impact of that in addition was that the uh companies that made uh flight control peripherals uh and racing wheels and pedals a lot of them you know contracted so cytec went out of business was purchased by logitech um or sorry was purchased by logitech in an effort to not go out of business mad cats uh, I think also purchased, well, uh, let me back up. SciTech was purchased by Mad Cats in an effort to not go out of business. And then Logitech, I believe, purchased Mad Cats and, of course, got SciTech along with it. Um, but, 
you had you had I mean you had Microsoft making peripherals back then. Um, just a lot of these things kind of kind of dried up because you know the market wasn't supporting it in the West. But over in Japan, you could see simulation games are still super popular. Uh, the real time Bob mentions in chat simulation games are higher than I would have expected. Yeah, exactly. In Japan, uh, Otakon Ocelot mentions I'm here. Had to fix one of our CNC machines. It's elective overtime on Saturday. Gotcha. Well, thanks a lot, Otakon. Thanks for swinging through. I appreciate you. If you uh, if you got time to have me on in the background while you're working, sorry, very sorry that you have to do that. By the way, I've got to work tonight too. I've got to dive deep on upskilling on data science, which is not my favorite, but we do what we have to do. Uh, on PC, the most popular genres are in Japan are RPG at thirty two percent, shooters at twenty three percent, and simulation games at twenty two percent. So. You see shooters ranking up high. That's kind of the same thing that you would expect in the West. RPGs up high, kind of some a similar thing you, you would expect to see in the West. One thing that's interesting that struck out stuck out at me was that the share across those genres is is different. So simulation games not as high um, as they are on console, which again, console is a weird place for simulation games to be high to me. But, you know, there they are. Um, probably maybe driven by the fact that consoles are more affordable than a high-end PC that you would need for simulation games. So the spread is a little more even out on PC amongst those top three, but you get shooters entering the mix as opposed to adventure games. Uh, again, adventure games on console is a weird thing to me, but again, I think if you've, if you've spent time and you've looked at Asian culture, it doesn't necessarily surprise me that you know, adventure games kind of have this association these days with the cozy game, uh, kind of subgenre or, or sub label that we're applying to things, and that so that doesn't necessarily surprise me. Top selling games in Japan in 2022 for monthly returns. So if you just, I just kind of took a look at, um, at uh, at monthly returns in Japan for 2022, and I just kind of picked out one that was kind of exemplary. That's not saying it was this way the entirety of the year, but this is very typical of a lot of months in uh, in Japan sales. So they included things like Splatoon 3, Dragon Quest Awakening of the Five Tribes Offline, Persona 5 The Royal, Near Automata, The End of Yura Edition, and The Legend of Heroes, Kuro no Kiseke 2, Crimson Sin. So going on with some of the information that I came across when I was researching this. Uh, so there are problems and challenges that video game companies face when they try to localize a game for Japan. And so proxy companies who are really consultants who are specialists in helping uh, Western companies kind of make their games, um, you know, more more ethnically and culturally centric to Japan, bring these things up and kind of give them this checklist of things that they need to look out for. But more so, there's a market for people offering these as professional services because it is so difficult to do. Uh, so there are symbolic and iconography norms, uh, things, you know, symbols that you know, if a Japanese person sees them, they associate them with, you know, you're trying to say this or you're trying to indicate that. Um, that, again, are, are tripwires that are not norms in Western cultures that you have to look out for when you're making a game. So you don't put something up like a graffiti sign, right, on a, on a wall that gets misinterpreted or, you know, taken to mean one thing when you thought that it was going to mean something else. Uh, activity norms, like the kind of things and characters that characters do in a video game uh, do for a hobby, such as photography or swimming. Um, meaning, so when you typically put characters in a game, typically there will be some associated thing, like in Tilu, you know, uh, Joel, uh, you know, played guitar, and then, you know, Ellie started playing guitar. Um, but what I'm saying here is, if guitar playing is not a social norm in Japan, then you putting in that in that game creates a cultural dissonance between what you're portraying in the game and what a person in Japan is looking for um, in terms of a video game in order to increase that immersion, increase that resonance, right? We, I think, I don't know, um, but for me, I resonate with characters um, that are like me or that have similar backgrounds or uh, are, are engaged in similar hobbies. Um, and so if you represent a character that does other things that make up their persona that don't resonate with a person in Japan, Things like calligraphy or ikebana, which, if I'm not mistaken, is like uh, like the pruning of and, and uh, managing of like the growth of bonsai trees. Um, they don't resonate with Japanese gamers as much. There are color associations, animal norms and symbology, lexical and linguistic particularity, speech styles, gender based norms, things that are culturally unacceptable to even include in entertainment as discussion topics such as religion, tobacco, drugs, etc. 
And if you look at a lot of Western games, we often brush on a lot of things like religion, like in Far Cry 5. Um, we often, you know, have representations of tobacco, character smoking, smoking cigars. If you look at a GTA, and then lots of references to drug use, right? If you look at something like, uh, like in, uh, in Cyberpunk isn't even really a, well, it doesn't come out of a Western culture. I would say it's a very kind of Westernized game. Um, but, you know, those things aren't really acceptable in Japan. Uh, Arakan Asala mentions, I, I put 14 years in construction since I was young. I may like it. <laughs> and then the real-time Rob mentions there's definitely more of a sim selection on PC. Yep. Uh, and then in Japan specifically, and I kind of mentioned this when I talked about, I think they're called the NPPB, but like the, or NPPD, the, the, uh, the regulatory board in China that actually reviews your games and ensures that it doesn't, that it supports the anti-addiction laws in China, which are very hyper-specific. In Japan, uh, violence and nudity are typically censored uh, in a game that's being released in Japan. Those are, um, you know, those are topics non grata uh, in that culture. Uh, so now extrapolate those hurdles across the multiple Asian cultures within the region, and you see the uphill battle that a decidedly Western company and brand like Xbox will face in attempting to dominate the gaming market at a global scale. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I want to go from there over to a post that I wrote. Uh, hats off to uh, to Perpetuity, uh, sometimes called Black Immortal on Twitter, uh, who coined the handle uh, Gamer Twitter Op-Ed, which I have definitely lumped onto. He, he applied that label to the types of things that I write on Twitter. That, so this is another Gamer Twitter Op-Ed. Um, so one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot with regards to Xbox's challenges is culture. Xbox is a decidedly Western brand. That, in fact, is one of the reasons I originally fell in love with the brand, because I grew up in a time where all the consoles and a lot of the game orientation was skewed based on Asian culture and Asian perspectives. Uh, the 50-year history of the gaming industry is one that has been predominantly reigned over by a triumvirate of Eastern platform owners. Once you clear Gen 1, Gen 2 uh, in gaming history, uh, and the likes of Atari, Coleco, Mattel, who made in television... Much of what characterizes the industry's face has been Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation. Other players such as Hudson Soft, NEC, SNK, who were behind Turbo Graphics, 3DO, etc. Uh, even if you lay Forza Motorsport or Horizon down next to Gran Turismo, Gran Turismo's approach to everything from its campaign structure, text button tab quests, gives versus voiceover in Forza, everything drips of an Eastern approach to motorsport and their love of automobiles versus Forza's toe dip into Top Gear and its lean towards European versus Eastern tracks. So, like, if you look at Forza, I mean, you should, like, if you're a big racing fan, notice, and I mean, they're the things that I love, right? Notice that the lean is definitely more towards uh, British tracks, tracks in, uh, in, in Belgium, Germany. Everybody's in love with, you know, Nürburgring and Nordschleife. Um, there's less of an emphasis in Forza, from my perspective, on um, on uh, on tracks in Japan. So uh, tracks in Italy also figure big, big in Forza. Uh, so looking at Xbox's acquisitions, which are all Western studios, but more importantly, the IP those studios work on, exude a Western approach to design, story premise, and UI. I want to take a few things from the chat here while I take a break. Uh, real time Robin since I'm in construction as well. Otacon mentions you tried out that game. Real time Rob. Whoa. Okay. Uh, Otacon mentions great post past few days to logic. I wish I could dance with you in the replies on Twitter, but it's above my head most days. I'm treading water out there. No worries at all, Otacon. I, I definitely, I definitely recognize the type of content long form that I write on Twitter is not uh, necessarily for everyone. I just put it out there in hopes that you know, and I'm trying to use Thread Reader app, which I think helps. Um, cause you can, then you can go back historically and like read these things and pull them apart. Um, th so back to Xbox, the entire brand drips America <laughs> and it's why I believe there's such a staunch following in defense force on Twitter, despite the upside down market share. So one of my beliefs is the reason why we see a lot of things like it's, it's always presented to me as very strange that Xbox occupies the smallest part of the market, but seems to have the loudest voice and the most aggressive people on Twitter um, defending the brand. And I think that's because Twitter is an American company. Um, and, you know, even, even I mean, a lot of the uh, East, you know, Eastern and Asian gamers that I see on Twitter write in, uh, in their native symbology, which obviously, you know, Westerners can't understand. So I think, I think a lot of it is driven by just that cultural alignment, right, to, uh, to the social media services and the IP. 
uh, in my opinion, Xbox will not be able to globalize its brand in the way it will need to re it, in the way it will need to to reach the supposed billions of latent gamers sitting behind non traditional screens the way it is tilted right now. So again, Xbox proclaims that basically, you know, the interpretation of their strategy is that there's a bunch of people sitting out in the world who are sitting behind other screens, non traditional gaming console and PC screens that will become gamers if you suddenly put content in front of their face. And I just don't know that that's true. And here I'm highlighting the point of, of why there's potentially a disconnect. Um, the world doesn't want that Americanized content. As Sean Layden himself has pointed out, one of the big things in his interview was, hey, if the world doesn't want to play Call of Duty, Fortnite, Sea of Thieves, um, and, and other games like that, is the gaming industry going to continue making that type of content and try to push it on people? That doesn't really make a ton of sense. Even in Japan, I just pointed out that like the the game, you know, it's re a relatively big gaming population. They've kind of not necessarily pioneered it, but they've definitely had a heavy hand in its influence uh, on that culture in the industry. And even at that, just north of fifty percent of their population are gamers. So, in the region of the in the area of the geographic region of the world where you would expect the most gamers to be, population saturation of gamers is is just above fifty percent. That's significant. That's better than the forty percent that we see. I think like leveled over the rest of the world, but that still indicates to me that it's not like we're going to turn the entire planet into, uh, in, into gamers, particularly gamers who want PC and console style content. So going back to this, the world does not want that Americanized content as Charlotte has himself pointed out without a strong effort to diversify its approach to IP UI design storytelling. It's an uphill battle and one that Xbox has not done well with Asia is home to over 1.5 billion gamers. Europe is next at 715 million, Latin America with 420 million. Again, the top three geographic regions in gamer population are not North America. And yet there's a North American company insisting that it has a strategy that it believes will allow it to dominate the gaming landscape when I feel at its very core, a lot of their IP is out of sync with the rest of the world. Uh, I think we often exude a cultural superiority complex, meaning here in the United States, because yes, America generates a lot of the revenue. We're neck and neck with China, but the Xbox stated strategy is about growth in numbers of gamers first with figuring out how to monetize it later. And so while even though we have a bulk of the revenue, we don't have a bulk of the numbers. While I love everything about the Western lean of the brand down to the industrial design of the Xbox series over the PlayStation 5, the current, this, the current dog don't hunt. Yes, Xbox needs to buy an Eastern developer and one of the big nine whose brands transcends any statistical deviation due to the cultural skew, like locking down EA for their soccer brand, which is global. They also need that Eastern dev or an Eastern tech think tank to help them start modulating their pie, perception, image, and exposure to play well on the global stage. Doing things like rankling up the Japanese FTC, riling up a bunch of US congressmen to claim Xbox is the underdog up against the big bad Asian brands. Yeah, that's not going to work. So Western big tech companies have experienced a lot of negativity and pushback, particularly on the European stage. So again, going that route of just trying to, you know, cause political kerfuffles, um, I don't necessarily think is going to be the thing that works. Um, so the real time Rob mentions in the chat, it almost seems like Microsoft encourages certain people on social media to push certain narratives. I would definitely agree with that. I think it's more nefarious than that. I think there's deliberate, overt coordination of messaging that happens between, you know, the GLT uh, and uh, and and social media participants um, because it's uncanny how the thematic messages of a lot of mainstream media and social media influencers. Uh, are are always in sync with the Xbox Corporation and how a, a social media influencer can express one view of a particular topic, let's say exclusives, and then five minutes after Xbox comes out and says exclusives are bad, immediately transitions their message to be in sync with Xbox, even though they said the exact opposite a year ago. It's very similar. It was very similar to what I pointed out with the CWA. Um, which is a union organization who a year before uh, the merger um, had had said that, you know, mergers and consolidation in the gaming industry were bad. 
Uh, so yeah, the co- I, CW, I forget remember the Workers Alliance. I forget what the C stands for. But but then six months after, after you know Microsoft had you know signed its um, its uh, I can't remember. It, it's like non. I can't remember. It's, it's there's a specific term for it, but it's basically a clause that's a, an ESG commitment that says. Uh, if an organization comes in here and tries to unionize, we we will not participate in um, in union busting behavior. Now, first of all, you're not supposed to participate in union busting behavior anyway um, because it's illegal. <laughs> but uh, there was some other additional commitment that they made saying that you know they would uh, they would not they would not overtly fight any attempts to unionize. It did not say that they would support it directly. It said that they wouldn't fight it. Um, and then suddenly. The CWA said, oh, this merger, the Activision Microsoft merger is good. Um, and so I think it's pretty clearly patently obvious that from a political perspective that that there was a, you know, there were conversations that, you know, said, hey, you know, here's here's the put and take. Here's the trade. You know, I'll do this, you know, then in exchange for your commitment, which I'm not saying is bad. I mean, that's that's what politics happen all the time. One congressman goes to another congressman and says, hey, I won't fight you on this if you support me on that. I get it. Um, but when, and so, so for the CWA and, 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 and Microsoft, I think that's a, that's okay. The disingenuity comes from presenting that as if it was altruistic and it happened organically and those discussions didn't happen. I think that's disingenuine. What's disingenuine from a social influencer perspective is when your responsibility, your mandate, your accountability is to champion all consumers regardless of whether or not they support your particular platform or not and when your responsibility and accountability accountability is for informing consumers and you contrive misinform mislead consumers to believe something that is for the purposes of supporting a brand not necessarily telling them the truth not necessarily arming them with information and then just allowing them to go out and make their own decision um that's my perspective and my point is that my my job, my service, my mission, whatever you want to call it, isn't to tell you to like Xbox or not like Xbox, like PlayStation, not like PlayStation, go buy a gaming PC or not. I have my own personal opinions and perspectives on that and things that drove me to make my own choices. But my job, service, mission is to arm you with information. I constantly say it on, on, on this podcast, on BRAP, on E2KG. My, my thing is to arm you with information, give you a point the platform off of to let you know what variables I was considering. And then for you to go from there and say, I don't agree with that guy said, but he thought about like these six other variables that I haven't heard other people talk about. Let me go pull the thread on those and make sure that I understand them. So that when I hear one influencer who just asserts, you know, a claim with no substantive, like objective, evidentiary, tangible, (laughs) right? support behind why they're asserting that, that I'm equipped to go find these variables. I may look at those six variables and decide that I agree with the influencer who didn't mention them. And me personally, GameLogic doesn't care. That's a great result. But my point is that I personally think consumers, particularly if you're going to participate on social media where that is observable by gaming corporations in the industry, that they see that you are thinking that you were thinking critically, that you were considering multiple variables, and that you're not just buying what a C-level officer says in a press release or on an earnings call. Because, as I mentioned before on another recent show, we've had instances where somebody like Nintendo, who we think of as like the most altruistic gaming corporation ever, right, has said, we're not releasing a new console, and then 30 days later releases a new console. So the point is, is that they say things that are beneficiary to beneficial to them, their strategy, their competitive stature on the market. You shouldn't just take those things at face value and just assume that they're true um, unless they corroborate with evidence that you can actually observe and not simply based on what someone tells you. Sorry, that's a long, you guys got me on my soapbox. So uh, let's see. Uh, the real time Rob says paid messaging. Communi- ah, yes, communications workers of American Union. Um, so yeah, I don't, and I, I don't believe. I mean, I I don't believe any corporations are necessarily paying people, but I do think that, um, you know, just providing them information, uh, game codes, I, I, I don't I don't know review copies, um, things that help them build out their channels and you know appear that they're more knowledgeable um, than other people. I mean, anything that helps, right? Um, 
I, th- I, th- I, th- I think is part of the, the, the barter exchange system of information versus influence, but that's just me. Uh, okay, so that was the story on the Japanese market. So I think we covered that. Okay, third story in the rundown that I want to talk about is uh, this new studio. Uh, Former id Software and Naughty Dog devs are teasing a new project. This story over on Destructoid by uh, Andrew Heaton. Uh, So I'll start with quoting the article. It's always interesting when veterans of the gaming industry break off and start new endeavors, and they don't come much bigger than Empty Vessel. Yes, that's it's really spelled that way. Uh, So it's all it's all it's all one. The two words are concatenated with no uh, no uppercase letters which is a team of developers consisting of some notable names from the likes of id Software and Naughty Dog. Um, sorry, just trying to find my show notes. Uh, so the team recently uploaded a teaser trailer to YouTube, and while the trailer reveals next to nothing, um, the background of the team alone is enough to gain the hint of the project that they've dropped and that they're working on a little bit of buzz. Uh, the team consists of Garrett Young, formerly of id Software, with work who has worked on Doom, Quake, and Rage, as well as time that he has spent at Microsoft and Activision. He is the studio's general manager. Uh, Alex Palma was on the Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal teams and is the project's art director. Colin Thomas, who spent 15 years at Naughty Dog and worked on Tilu and Uncharted, is the team's character designer. Mick Gordon, who is a composer and audio effects artist, has also joined the team. Now, this trailer shows basically next to nothing, but what appears to be, but what it does show is that is what appears to be a dystopian urban area as the background, some ongoing gunfire, a small explosion, and then what appears to be either a helmet or a robot head roll onto the screen from the left-hand side. Uh, Hit the ground and tumble a few rotations into the middle of the screen. Graffiti can be seen on what appears to be a safety uh, wall or maybe on maybe a balcony or an elevated walkway uh, behind the helmet. And then what appears to be scrawled on that wall in graffiti is a is a message that says break the system uh, written out. The only show notes under their video say we are Empty Vessel, a studio with a focus in immersive shooters. Here's a taste of the battle between control and chaos that the system has in store for you. The trailer is 33 seconds long. The studio's website says some things that appear both interesting and encouraging, but one thing that caught my eye is that in addition to building out an inclusive and diverse team, they expect to soon be joined by a gaming community that they, well, they soon, ah, they expect to soon be joined by, I quote, a gaming community who will help craft the new horizon of gaming, end quote. Uh, what this causes me to believe is that one, whatever they're working on is going to go into early access. Uh, or whatever label or version that is on whatever platform it's going on. So Xbox calls it, I can't even remember. Uh, it's called something different on every platform. Early access is the Steam label. So the equivalent of that is where I expect this to go. And then two, it's highly likely to be a gas game or a game as a service game, or at least a living, never ending game, kind of like Destiny 2 was at the outset before it got super heavy with microtransactions when it was mainly about a game with you know periodically released uh, advanced, you know, uh, advancing content, evolving the story um, over time. Uh, if not being just a straight up MMO. Um, one of the things I do when a company talks about inclusivity and diversity, going back to that on, on their on their website, uh, is I go check out their employee composition or leadership to see if they're walking the walk. A lot of companies will say that there are priorities, that these are priorities for them. But then when you go to the team page and no offense, it's all white males. Um, so it just doesn't track with, you know, saying that they have an emphasis on inclusive in- inclusivity and diversity. And then you go to their page and that's not actually the makeup of the company. Uh, so now you can't judge a book by its cover, nor can you come to a final judgment on diversity based solely on images on uh, an about page uh, for a company or a studio. But I feel it is enough to for me to get a feel for whether the company is headed down that path. Uh, while we are in this age of the anti SBI movement, so the anti sweet baby ink movement, you might ask why I care. 
Uh, well, I care because I'm a minority, as you can see from my image on the camera. <laughs> uh, I have family members that are minorities. I have uh, younger people, uh, you know, in my extended family who I want to be able to go out into the technical landscape and have an opportunity to pursue an employment, pursue employment, pursue a career just like I did. Um, uh, so I have friends and I want all of them to be able to have opportunities to work in the technology field like I do. So these things matter to me and are important, I think. Uh, I'm pleased to say that Empty Vessel does look like it is not just hand-waving when it comes to making this comment. I uh, spot-checked other talent on the team and not only does it consist of creative veterans, but they also have advisors on board to help them navigate the business challenges as well. I've mentioned on this show and others that you know when you know in this day and age, you know sa like Saber breaking away from Embracer, um, uh, Toys for Bob breaking away from Xbox, um, a lot of these you know additional studios that we that we always see, but in particular now, you know we see people breaking away from a larger corporation, losing that big financial backing, what is essentially a, the venture capital for that small studio, and going out on striking out on their own, and then also adopting the label that they're a triple A studio, like. This is a hostile environment. This is not friendly, right, to survival of small studios like this. And so, you know, there, there are business challenges for these studios to surmount. Uh, for Empty Vessel, they to help them navigate those business challenges, they have uh, an advisor from NHN, which is a Korean investment firm that specializes, specializes in tech and gaming companies. Uh, that person is no longer employed by NHN, but she brings that experience. Uh, they also have a younger engineer just out of college, showing that this, showing to me that the studio is trying to put some youth on the team that can provide a generational perspective on design and creative choices that the team will be making. So again, diversity isn't just about race, color, religion, sexual orientation. It's also just about diversity of thought and different perspectives. Um, their technical director, Wei Ning, has a background that is more on the film side, but of note, he brings specialties in cloud infrastructure and backend networking services, which again... I see as a tell that this will be a game as a service type of game. The team also includes a senior weapons artist, Paval Humaj, who seems to specialize in physical props more so than digital, which seems to indicate to me that the team will start with an artistic physical model of a game's of the game's weapons and then hand them over to developers who will instantiate instantiate them as conceptual and logical models and eventually then place them as dynamic objects in the game. So the fact that as a core member of their early team they have a senior weapons artist that tells me that this is going to be a super a game that is super, I mean, you know, the team has advertised that they're shooters, but it also tells me that they're taking a specific particular approach um, to crafting weapons in this game. Uh, and one, I mean, Apex Legends probably does one of the, you know, best jobs, I guess, of that where there is clearly um, an, an artistic bend to write how they render those weapons in the Titanfall universe and then make them digital objects in the game. Uh, I also noticed that an advisor to the company is Riley Russell. Russell was in the legal department at Sony Interactive Entertainment, eventually serving as the chief legal officer and general counsel. He worked at SIE for 22 years, running the legal show during the Ellen Page Quantic Dream legal kerfuffle, being involved in negotiations in the original effort to make Tilu a movie that would have been directed by Sam Raimi. So I brought that up because I completely either forgot it or missed it. Like didn't even think about the fact that that was part of Sony's history. Uh, Screen Gems, which was, I guess, the company, Sam, the film studio Sam Raimi was associated with, eventually left the table after Druckmann probably seems like dragged his feet because he was reluctant to give up the IP to Screen Gems because they typically took a very stylized take and approach, like with Re the Resident Evil games, that would kind of step away from the IP and the lore of the game. Uh, Ru uh, Russell was also involved in the lawsuits that developed out of the PSN hack of 2011 and the PlayStation Store antitrust suit of 2021. Russell now leads Kojima Production Studio Division, which specializes in deals that bring the company's gaming IP to television, music, and film. So this is a person who's heavily involved in, you know, in... Ah, crap. Oh, sorry, I just kicked over my UPS because I had to drag it over to the left, so hopefully we don't lose power. Uh, but I'll try and wrap this up. Um... But uh, but this is a person who's probably heavily involved with the with the FizOps uh, effort that was um, announced at the recent showcase uh, that Kojima is working on. Uh, all of this is to say it's just interestinger and interestinger as I pull the thread on the team's makeup and kind of look back behind the scenes at what may or what they may be pulling together and what's going on. 
Uh, while Triple A Ventures for new studios are fraught with more risk than ever, as I mentioned earlier, this is one that I will definitely be keeping an eye on. Uh, so, so that's all the scripted content. Just to wrap things up, uh, other things that I have going on. Um, games that I've been playing, uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. I continue to play that on PC. I just installed a 4070 Super uh, on... I can't tell if I can see it behind me, but it's, it's that one. Um... <laughs> On, on that PC, which runs 25 inch monitors, super high, super high speed. They're 240 hertz monitors. They are only uh, 1080p, 25 inch. Um, but on Call of Duty, with all of the details cranked up, uh, I'm getting, uh, I am actually seeing 240 frames per second, which is the first time that I've ever seen that uh, on that machine. Um, first time I've ever seen it, partially because I, I, I had taken those 25 inch high speed monitors down and was kind of using them as what I call pony monitors, which is what I hook my uh, health and monitoring. PC up to when I do live streams and podcasts. Um, but uh, yeah, it's super, super happy with that, seeing that, that performance on there. I continue to have a blast with Call of Duty, particularly as they're incorporating more and more of the old maps and putting them in the map rotation. Uh, I also have been playing Metro Exodus on PC. So we talked a lot tonight about 4A games, and that's kind of one of the reasons why was because I'm actively playing one of their titles now. Uh, the real time Rob says, nice. Thanks a lot, Rob. Um, and Metro Exodus, uh, I am playing on a machine with a 4080, uh, and seeing 144 frames per second, um, uh, because that's the max, um, uh, uh, response rate on that monitor, a refresh rate on that monitor. Um, so I'm seeing 144 frames per second and that's with, uh, all the details turned up, extreme graphic settings, um, ray tracing on HDR, blah, blah, blah. So all the bells and whistles, the enhanced version was a version that came up came out for that game after its initial release so and and incidentally that game the gold edition of that game is actually on sale now on the epic game store and on steam for 7.99 and so you get the core game you get the enhanced version which includes like a heavy ray tracing uh rgti uh implementation um i mentioned on a tweet that i put out about it that you can go uh, take a look at the all the technical details behind that implementation. I think there's a ton like it's that the gaming community gets wrong in the discussion about ray tracing and just graphical implementations in general. Um, and that was a re was really one of the best kind of consolidated reads about ray tracing, global illum illumination, SSAO, uh, SSR that I've seen written up um, in in pretty excruciating detail. So if you want to go check that out, go to the 4A website and look at that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but I took that game, the, the, the outset of that game, like the first hour, um, getting, uh, just getting through kind of the introduction and then, and then on the train, which kind of becomes kind of your mobile HQ, um, in the game is really, it's, it's not painful, but it's, it, there's a lot of stealth in it. It's, it's just the pacing in it is just a little off putting. Um, but if you get through that in about an hour, then you really get exposed to a really a great game. Um, the thing I will say about 4A Studios, 4A Studios to me is a studio that has an ethos a lot like Crytek, um, where there's a hyper focus, I think, on visual implementations um, and where, I mean, I've read articles and interviews from their developers before and they like, they like really take it to heart if their game is not like one of the best looking games on the market. So, uh, and it really shows uh, in Metro Exodus, just like I said, with all those details turned up. And I'm playing that on a 27-inch 1440p monitor. It's just an incredible experience. Uh, Autocon Ocelot mentions, I need to play those games. I remember playing the first one on, on Xbox 360, I think. Yeah, I can't. Uh, th that th that series, I'll, I'll pull that apart one, one other day. Uh, extremely long history between uh, uh, geez, uh, Metro 2033, Metro Last Light, Metro Last Light Redux, and then uh, Metro Exodus. Um, long story history. But yeah, it's a, it's a great franchise. Uh, the first two games, and if you've played those games, like Metro Exodus, to me, while it includes a lot of the design ethos of the original two games, to me is a more pleasant game because um, depending on kind of what your disposition and predilections are for games like I, not a super huge fan of claustrophobic games, Metro 23 and to be Metro Less are very super hyper claustrophobic games. Um, it really like like closes you in your fov isn't that wide they put you in the freaking mask all the time you're constantly i mean you get a little bit of this is metro exit but you're constantly like in interior corridor environments where it's super dark 
you're you know you're you're with the vision is very tight um you're constantly hearing kind of horror movie type sounds like off in corners uh it's 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 really it's unpleasant <laughs> like it, they're great games but like you feel uncomfortable the whole time particularly if you're like me and you play late at night um metro exodus really opens up that aperture it really gets you into outdoor environments um it it there's 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 more fun effect to the game i feel like so um it's kind of nice if you've played the original two games and then you get to metro exodus and you and you get like that that you feel like you can breathe right while playing the same kind of ip so the real time rob mentions uh, i wanted to upgrade my motherboard what would you recommend i'm only one year into pc gaming coming from playstation but no not at all R R rob don't don't ever you know, need to excuse your, your ignorance like i like when I when I was first learning how to build PCs like 24, 25 years ago, like, I mean, that's that's what you have to do. You have to ask questions. Um, and I, I've never been a fan of, you know, you you would go into these forums and you would get these, I'll just say it, call them assholes who, you know, act like because you don't know everything, you know, that they somehow feel superior to you. I'm like, I don't I don't know. How, I've never understood how that's beneficial, right, to the to the community. So. Uh, Otacon mentions I'm an ignorant man. I think you're I think you're less than an ignorant man, Otacon, or you, you you wouldn't be here listening to this show and you wouldn't be coming by uh, the Brat podcast to listen. A real time mom mentions currently I have an Azrock B four fifty Phantom. Okay, so uh and so you said you wanted to change out your motherboard. I, I guess maybe my first question, Rob, is why do you want to change out your motherboard? Um the way the approach that I've settled into again over like going on three decades doing this is um, typically, I split my upgrade path into halves, um, and and I'll do like like a TikTok kind of upgrade. Uh, usually, I will. Uh, so if I've built a PC, at some point, what I will typically do is I've built a PC around a foundational base, right? That I think of as like the case, the power supply, the motherboard, and processor. And then from there, I will typically do an incremental upgrade where I will upgrade the GPU uh, and maybe add more RAM. But my point is, is that I typically size my PC build around a uh, power supply uh, uh, voltage level, wattage level, uh, and a motherboard uh, and a processor that will support me upgrading to, to a GPU. And what I mean by that in terms of processor is making sure that I buy a processor that's big enough that I don't really have to be worried about it bottlenecking the GPU uh, when I upgrade in the future. Uh, so, so when you say you want to upgrade your motherboard, my perspective I'm not, I'm not, i shouldn't assume that you're that you upgrade on the same paradigm that i do and then my point is so i typically will incrementally upgrade the gpu and then the next upgrade that i do will typically be what i call a foundational or an infrastructure upgrade where typically just for luxury reasons i will move it to another case although that's certainly not required i will typically get another power supply because at that point i'll typically want to up voltage or i want to deal with new power connectors we get these stinking 12 volt high power power connectors that now we have to deal with um but also because I never want to have a power supply for so long that I have to be concerned about its reliability or stability. Um, but then I will also do a motherboard and processor and RAM upgrade, sometimes typically because, you know, we've moved from DDR3 to DDR4 or DDR4 to DDR5. So when you talk about upgrading your motherboard, I'm orienting around the notion that you're you're also wanting to upgrade your CPU or, or maybe upgrade to a motherboard that allows you to upgrade your CPU. Um, so if you're on a B450 now, uh, I don't have it memorized, but my guess is that supports everything. I mean, R Ryzen's really good. Uh, I would like another M2 drive, so future proof. Okay, so this is just me. Um, so, so my first input would be, I don't know that you need to upgrade your motherboard in order to upgrade, in order to get another SSD. And the reason I say that, and again, it's totally up to you. I, I, I have my own jaded view of what I think of as a pain in the butt from regards to, look, I'm getting older. I'm getting to the point now where me being hunched over a case for a day, right, doing a PC build is not necessarily enjoyable. Every time I do it now, I'm like, ah, maybe I should just buy a PC. Um, but my point is, is that, uh, so you want to get an extra M2 drive uh, in the box, Um so Otacon also mentions, I'm hoping I'll be in a better spot to build a PC if all the planets line up and Uncle Sam sends me back a big enough pennies back. Yep. Um, so here's my feeling, and sometimes I worry about like how this kind of gives around. I don't, to me, I don't believe that there is a very huge impactful uh, experiential delta between an M2 drive and a two and a half inch SSD. So if you're trying to get more SSD storage in your box, 
and you only have one M2 slot or two M2 slots, I don't know that upgrading your motherboard to get an extra M2 drive is really a necessity. I would just get a two and a half inch SSD and just throw it in the box and, and hook up the SATA cable and be done with it. Um, the reason I say that is because the, the difference in the speeds is at such a microsecond level that it's just, I don't think it's really going to matter to you. Um, and the only thing that that drive really does is it, help loads, it helps load levels faster in playing a game. So at, at best, like the most you're going to do, um, if you even shave off as much as a full second or two seconds, I think that's you know mostly what you will see. Um, I, I don't really know that you're going to like feel like a big enough difference. Now, you are getting some games where maybe an M2 drive versus a 2.5-inch SSD may help performance, right, in terms of like a Ratchet and Clank, um, or maybe even when Spider-Man 2 gets to PC. Um, but, and you get, so there, there's a very small handful of games that are coming through now that I'll see something like, oh, you know, our requirement is now that it is, a, it is an M2 SSD. I mean, if it depends on what you're configuring. Do you have one in the box or two in the box? Uh, but my personal feeling is for me, personally, if I when I see something like that come through, and I don't like installing games on my C drive, that's just me personally, um, because if if something happens with my C drive, and there are definitely split philosophies on this, if my if my C drive is an M2 SSD, so you have one in the box, okay? If my C drive is an M2 SSD, and something happens to it, and I need to restore it, um, my view of the world is if my games are on the D and the E drive, which admittedly in my boxes typically tend to be another M, other M2 SSDs, then those those installs are fine and they're not mucked with. Um, and then I'm just swapping out the operating system. Um, was thinking between another M2 or an external. Yeah, I, I would, like I said, I, I, my personal thing is I would go with a two and a half inch SSD in the box hooked up over SATA. Um, Depending on the game, I think you can definitely get away with uh, an external. Um, you can even get an M2. You can even take an M2 drive, put it in an M, in an external enclosure, which I, I don't. I don't think I have one within reach here. But like I've, I've had some M2 SSDs that are like small, like five hundred twelve uh, uh, gigabytes or uh, or one terabyte, and then you know. I've taken them out, replaced them with a larger M2, taken the smaller one, put it in an external enclosure, and then hooked it up over USB-C. So that's w that's the way I'll do a lot of like my recording for uh, for videos. Um, but depending on the type of game, you could even do that right for you know, install games on it. You will get some longer load times, but you know that may not be really huge or material. Uh, Otacon mentions I'm learning every episode of Brap and running off of Infinity. Thanks a lot, Otacon. Um, but my, my personal feeling is, uh, for your purposes, I, I would just put an, a two and a half inch SSD in the box. I would not upgrade the motherboard. And the reason why I say that is because in order to upgrade your motherboard, you're going to have to, uh, take off your cooling solution, whether that's, that's air or liquid. Um, you're going to have to remove the CPU, uh, which I just, I still to this day after, you know, 20 something years, I still find that like a nerve wracking experience where I'm like super nervous that I'm going to break a pin. I've never broken a pin. Um, and I literally like I do anywhere from two to four builds a year um, and I've never broken a CPU pin. It still makes me clench and be very super <laughs> experienced, like high anxiety during it. But you're going to have to take all that stuff out. You're going to have you're going to have to disconnect the power supply from like every connection that lands on the motherboard. And so to me, to, to me, those things are the way I view builds is that there are certain there's a very small number of certain specific things that you do in a PC build that to me make me go, okay, if I'm going to do that, I'm just going to build a whole new PC and ripping the motherboard out is one of those. Like if I have to like the, the motherboard is where everything connectorizes right onto the PC. Um, and if I'm going to do that, that's to me, that's like, that's my tripwire for saying I'm just doing a new build. Um, other people think about it differently. Uh, so, so like I said, I, I mean, and then, and then when you pull that CPU off, here's another anxiety inducing thing. You're going to have to clean the top of that, um, of the thermal paste, um, with, uh, with alcohol and a Q-tip, um, clean it off and then reapply thermal paste, uh, which is another anxiety inducing thing. Um, again, like 20 something years, I like literally every time I go, I'm like, uh, am I going to do a, a P dot? Am I going to do an X? Am I going to do like, am I going to smooth the paste out on top of the thing? Like, 
I kind of go back and forth because quite honestly, when I build one where I get like super great temperatures, quite honestly, two years later when I'm, you know, uh, you know, you know, upgrading that PC, I'm like, crap, did, like which method did I use to apply the thermal paste this time? But so, um, yeah, it's starting to sound more like just get a new PC in a few years. So, um, yeah, I would. So, so seriously, like, to, to your, and I have encountered your problem before. Um, I actually had uh, actually the PC that I'm on right now is one that w- was a store bought. I ordered it from Cyber Power PC. It's the, like it's it's the only PC that I've like store bought in jeez like twenty it's like twenty years. Um, I think there have been times when I've ordered like a Dell or a. Uh, or a uh, or an Alienware, I think, but I have, but I, you know, for twenty years, like I've just been only building, um, and like I said, I've been building for about a total of twenty five. Um, this PC came with, uh, I wasn't able to hit the NVMe drive, and I think I think the way some older motherboards are, maybe even today, I, I think and this was a point where when SS when M two SSDs first came in, there was a whole big thing about like. If you were going to install the operating system on that, you would have to um, install the OS before you hooked up a two and a half inch SATA drive. And I think that's because they were the PCIe bus actually went through the primary SATA header as well. And so the connectivity of those two storage interfaces back to the CPU, I think, went through the same. So the SATA pin, the SATA zero pin on this was actually pulled off of the board and the pins were loose, and and as and what I also saw is then I co- also couldn't hit the NVMe drive, so I couldn't hit the primary SATA drive, and I couldn't hit the NVE, NVMe, and I was like, okay, I think this is one of these boards where those things go through the same uh, interface wiring on the PCB, interface trace on the PCB. So this box has nothing in it, and I think it only has one NVMe port. So this box, I think, I think has nothing in it but two and a half inch SSDs. Um, so, so, so when I, you know, was looking at what I was, what was I going to do about storage on this SSD was my only option. Um, and yeah, rather, again, rather than like upgrade the motherboard, right. I just said, look, I'm just going to throw some additional SSDs in the box. So, and I've hit like different iterations of that problem where, you know, I've been looking, I've been wanting to expand storage and NVMe wasn't an option or, uh, or I was like upgrade the motherboard or, or add a two and a half inch SSD. I just don't, I personally just don't think I, the, the deltas are in the noise. So I would uh, add a two and a half inch SSD over SATA. Um, and then as you mentioned, like in a couple years, then I would look at doing uh, an upgrade where I pulled the motherboard, um, bought a new CPU, uh, new power supply, new case. Um, now at that point, given now again that's my upgrade cycle you don't have to do that in two years you could go longer than that i do a lot of upgrading that's unnecessary because i love building pcs um i would say um if you if you do it in two years you could definitely keep your old box and use it as a streaming pc or a backup gaming pc whatever you want to do um or you could salvage parts out of that right to pull into your new build um so i, I think you're good for a while and in fact on a b450 board you might even be good even then um, because uh, AMD does a really good job of uh, of allowing backwards compatibility with its older chipsets with its new CPUs, and so um, for uh, for quite a while, I was able to upgrade uh, to new generations of the Ryzen CPU just by flashing the BIOS on my motherboard and uh, and upgrading it via firmware so that it could accommodate the new CPU. So even then, you're not going to be necessarily required. Um, now, in this generation, because they went from DDR4 to DDR5, then you were hitting some kind of hard stops where you really needed to upgrade your motherboard um, in order to uh, in order to bring on a new CPU. Uh, but Thermal Time Rob says, uh, I built mine through CLX. Uh, I guess the only other thing I will mention, in addition to the games that I've been playing, is just kind of some things that you might want to take a look at going on on the tech space in addition to the gaming news. Uh, there's some news out there over on Android Central about uh, Galaxy S24 uh, sales numbers. So the, the, and that the S24 Plus is seeing the biggest growth um, after years where the uh, S24 Ultra and the baseline S24 have been the big winners. Um, still, the S24 Plus actually has the smallest number of sales share, uh, but it is experiencing the most growth, indicating that maybe people are getting to a point where that midline model kind of is the best of both worlds, where it doesn't provide you know it's not the cost isn't as high 
as the Ultra, um, but uh, it has more features than the S24. And actually, the S24 Plus this year has the same amount of RAM as the Ultra, whereas in the past, it's had the RAM of the uh, of the base. So it's actually a pretty good deal this year. And the Ultra actually went up in price, I think, by 100 bucks. Uh, no problem at all, Real Time Rob. Feel free to ask any questions here anytime you want to, or hit me up on Twitter, or ask questions in the comments, uh, whatever uh, works best for you. Uh, the Google I.O. date is out there. I believe it is May 14th. Um, registration is open for that. Obviously, registration is several thousand dollars, I think, uh, to make the trip plus travel. So uh, obviously, I won't be attending that, <laughs> but, but I do keep tabs on it uh, and keep an eye on it. Uh, I think I had an invite to go one year, uh, but I never went. Uh, also, a new story about the FTC and DOJ think that McDonald's ice cream should be legal to fix. Mainly, this is about the FTC and the DOJ trying to extend the right to repair laws that have come into place um, to commercial equipment as well. A uh, little known fact, but apparently um, the McDonald's ice cream machine that is almost always broken and down is because McDonald's sells that to its franchises and then tells them they can't repair it, that they have to call an authorized technician from the actual McDonald's corporation to come fix their ice cream machine, which is why ice cream machines, the, typically the, the mean time to repair, um, sorry, um, for an ice cream machine is like 90 days when it breaks. That's why you go to McDonald's and they're always broken. So you learn lots of weird things. <laughs> and there are causalities behind things that we see in the world um, when you dive into the tech news. And then Google uh, has been rolling out a, it looks like they're rolling out a new category system for Google Drive. I'm a heavy Google Drive user. Um, and so they're going to roll out this, these uh, things called categories that you'll be able to hit the, the meatball, the three ball thing up in the upper, upper right hand corner and access like your categories, which that's very cool. But I'm like, how is that any different from folders? Um, but we'll see how it goes. It'll be interesting to see how that works on both Android uh, and on desktop PC. So I think that's going to do it for me for today. Uh, until next time, take care of yourselves. Stay safe out there. Play the games that you like. Come here to talk to me about the games that you love. For uh, for everybody who rolled through the uh, live stream and in the chat, I appreciate you. Thank you very much, Real Time Rob. Thank you very much, Otacon. Uh, thanks again for the most recent subscribers. So thank you, Zach. Thank you, Maddie124. Thank you, Josama2D. Thank you, Mark Dietrich. Uh, so for all you guys, uh, again, I appreciate you. Thank you very much for coming through. For anybody who wants to watch the archive version, of this podcast on the Routing Off Infinity Gaming channel on YouTube, please feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you can just receive a notification whenever I post new content. Um, if you don't know the format of talking about games, I have no idea when I'm going to do another one. Uh, I've done two at this time in Saturday mornings. Uh, maybe we'll continue to do that. Maybe not. Uh, I the band signal on this is to, for me is totally at random because I'm, I'm trying to do this show without making it like a super pressure anxiety thing about like, I have to do it every Saturday morning or Tuesday night or whatever. So just keep an eye on the Twitter account um, or on the front page of the YouTube channel where I will typically post uh, when I plan on doing one of these next, once I'm in the spool up loop and writing the script, like I said, I spend typically about, you know, 24 to 72 hours pulling together the script and doing the research uh, for the show. Um, so I think that's going to be it. If you want to join me for the Enough to Keep Going Weekly Games podcast on the E2KG Network podcasting channel on YouTube, that show is 8.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time uh, on Sunday nights. And so we, we will be live tomorrow night, 17 March at that at that time. Sometimes we're about 15 minutes late due to technical difficulties or kids. Um, so, yeah, but we should, we're typically online uh, fairly close to that time. Uh, and then if you want to join me for the Basement Radio Arcade podcast over on BRAP's channel on YouTube, that show is at 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Wednesday nights. And then every once in a while, I show up on the Damage Per Second podcast with Slow Mo and uh, Gaming Forte. And sometimes I will show up on the Gaming Circle podcast, uh, which is going on right now, in fact, on Saturday morning. So definitely go check those guys out as well. Everborn Saga and TKO Asante. So until next time, once again, thanks very much, everybody joining in. That's going to do it for me. Once again, my name has been Game Logic for the Rounding Off Infinity Gaming Channel on YouTube. Good night, good luck, and good gaming. That's going to do it for me. I'm out of here. <laughs>